Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, and share with you my thinking around um, how education is the single most important factor in addressing human security because it's at the foundation of uh, the society, the economy, our governance structures and our institutions. So even um, this is even more important today as we are uh, embarking on the further uh, great disruption um, that has just begun. And um, so my talk today is about the new economics for the great disruption. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, what is that great disruption that we could leverage uh, to increase human security through education. So we're all familiar with the climate crisis, uh, the financial crisis, the energy crisis, and in short, the meta crisis that we need to understand if we uh, hope to begin to address any of the great uh, challenges that we have today, because uh, they're all manifestations of the Anthropocene, uh, which uh, underlies uh, our failing economic uh, systems. So the great disruption that I'm referring to comes from the technology in general. I'm a computer scientist myself and uh, more so the technology convergence, which uh, should give us a lot of hope and which needs to be an intrinsic part of uh, education. Because if it's driven in the smart way, it can lead to carbon neutrality. Uh, and I will talk about three major sectors of the society that can together uh, address uh, or um, reduce 90% of the current uh, CO2 emissions uh, by th 2035, uh, if, uh, if it's done properly. So let's uh, take this step by step. So uh, for one, um, the current system, as I said, the current economic system um, is dealing with uh, uh, with a failing uh, situation. And uh, there are many researchers who have focused on this. Uh, one of them is uh, Joseph Tainter, who in his book, The Collapse of uh, Complex Societies, um, argued that evolved society like, uh, societies like the Mayan, the Sumerian, and the Romans um, collapsed because the societies could no longer finance, and this is an important uh, factor, uh, the ever-growing complexity. And uh, economists uh, call that the law of diminishing returns. And we have experienced that in our societies now in the 21st century um, in, in the form of the financial crisis of 2008, uh, the current uh, energy crisis um, uh, triggered and enhanced by the war in uh, Ukraine. So the law of diminishing returns is marked by increasing inflationary uh, results. Uh, there is more money being printed and put into uh, failing systems that are not being changed. And uh, so that's um, the current predicament of uh, humanity. And that cannot continue. But for the first time in human history, uh, we are encountering something that education can bring to the forefront. Uh, to ensure uh, human security. And that is the great disruption that is caused by technology and convergence of technology. And um, that's called by um, records by the law of diminishing return uh, of accelerated returns as opposite to the law of the diminishing returns. And the law of accelerated returns is marked by the speed, the cost effectiveness, uh, the power of evolutionary process that actually brings more um, results at lower cost and grows exponentially over time. And we see that uh, manifested in, in several technology, technology sectors of the society, like uh, the technology convergence. And we all have the, the smartphone uh, that is, uh, is a manifestation of that. And before 2007, that would have not been possible because uh, the computing, the network capacity, the data imaging, lithium iron batteries, GPS, and all the goodies that we have in there did not converge. And so that's uh, different today, and that gives us hope, uh, particularly since we can see from an economic perspective that the incumbents, like in, in that case, in the phone case, the Nokia and Siemens, they didn't see it coming, but the newcomers, the entrepreneurs, so that's where the hope lies. Uh, see that and leverage it. And if you look at the uh, uh, the abundance created since 1995, uh, they were all created by the incumbents like Apple and Google and Skype and Alibaba and so on. So that's a, a huge, huge opportunity that we have. And uh, so the great disruption created by uh, within the energy sector 
uh, shows us that the future energy will no longer come from fossil fuels, but from uh, from photon and uh, uh, solar technologies and wind technologies and uh, batteries, and they all converge. And um, and uh, for the first time in uh, in human history, actually, uh, in 2022, the investments in clean energy technologies uh, were uh, the same. We're matching the investments in in fossil fuel and power generation uh, for the first time. Another sector that of the great disruption um, is the sector of uh, transportation. And um, that's, for instance, um, due to the convergence of um, of electric vehicles, of um, autonomous driving vehicles, of batteries again. And the future is uh, transportation as a service called TAS, T-A-A-S, um, because uh, people will uh, sign up for the transport, not for the car, to sit here and, and be parked. Yes. And um, so that's another extreme uh, reduction uh, in, uh, in uh, CO2 emissions and many, many, many others. Well, the food uh, disruption is uh, the third sector that is in, in extremely important and that needs to be uh, brought in uh, part of the education uh, because it's uh, it's going to be coming from uh, cells and uh, uh, from um, uh, synthetic biology, uh, precision protein instead of killing animals, which will result eventually in uh, significant reductions, uh, not, uh, not also in land use, but also in, in animals. We won't be killing animals to eat them any longer because the technology is there to provide food uh, for the world. So that's uh, my contribution to this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana. I'm Chantalin Carpentier. I'm very happy to be with you. Um, and, you know, let me just start by saying we've been teaching pretty much one system of economics, maybe two, ecological economics, natural resource economics, you know, but mostly one system, as Mariana said. And with the prior to the, the COVID-19, we saw that um, basically we were making some progress on SDG 1 to SDG 9 at the expense of the SDG 10 to SDG 16. What does that mean? We advance economic issues and poverty issues at the expense of the environment and social justice and social cohesion. Uh, and therefore our economic system clearly did not deliver for people and planet. Now, following the COVID-19, we're seeing that um, increasingly what we need and in the context of the SDG mid term, which is the SDG summit coming up in September, we are calling for new economics for sustainable development and beyond GDP measures of progress so that we stop being in that one um, uh, economic thinking and focusing only on one of the three dimension of sustainable development economics at the expense of sustainable uh, of environment and social. Uh, and so we need to start teaching a plurality of economics. Um, and uh, of, of financial system as well. And Mariana, you set the table pretty well because we have two people now. We're going to go to Ayman, who will be speaking about entrepreneurship um, for or for human security. Uh, and so, how do we teach that? Then, um, so Ayman, maybe you just introduce yourself quickly. Uh, Ayman is a good friend, CEO, president of the International Council on Small Business, but also deputy uh, chair of the department at George Washington University. So Ayman. Thank you and greetings Chantaline. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And it is a privilege and honor to be here today. And again, my, I am Ayman Tarabishi, uh, president and CEO of the International Council for Small Business, uh, the oldest and largest nonprofit organization promoting entrepreneurship and small business. I'm also deputy chair at George Washington University Department of Management. I teach entrepreneurship. And I was uh, given a task today to talk about entrepreneurship education as it relates to, to uh, human security and also how do we do it? What's the application of it? What's the process here? So I prepared um, a brief um, comments here and no more than three minutes explaining it. And then uh, we'll open up, uh, I'll give it back to Chantaline to continue the session here. So um, for me, um, as, as I mentioned a little bit alluded earlier here, entrepreneurship education can have a profound impact on human security and humane through humane entrepreneurship. Through the study of entrepreneurship, individuals can gain a deeper understanding of how business decisions affect both people and the environment. And I underscore people here because of human security. But by developing sustainable entrepreneurship, 
um, uh, education for human security through this concept of what we call humane entrepreneurship. Individuals can be empowered to make informed decisions that benefit their own lives and contribute to the greater good. And I'll discuss the benefits of entrepreneurship education for human security to a potentially that can play a significant role in, in people's lives. In a study done by DeGraw and Bloomberg in 2017, they stated that entrepreneurship can be a pathway to human security by providing economic opportunities, which are really critical, increasing incomes, and improving the well being of individuals, families, and communities. Entrepreneurship education can give people the skills and knowledge to start and manage their businesses, potentially leading to improved financial security. It also fosters competence, risk-taking, improves risk-taking, and helps people become self-reliant. The potential for entrepreneurship education can also be improving. The human security is clear. It's evident here. And in a research that I have done with colleagues here, we identified a concept called humane entrepreneurship as a means to improve human security. And a paper that we have published in 2018 that we argue that a form of entrepreneurial activity focused on the human and ethical development of individuals and communities can create economic security and sustainability in developing countries. We examined the impact of this and found the presence of humane entrepreneurship in countries that are really focused on the human aspect, which is economic safety, health security, and food security. Furthermore, we found that it contributes to the creating jobs and income and the ability of increased health services and the production of better food. Humane entrepreneurship was also found to contribute to the development of social and environmental sustainability, which is essential for long-term human security. It is clear, therefore, that humane entrepreneurship can play a critical role in improving human security in developing countries. But how? The question is how, how do we do this? We, we proposed three strategies for this. The first one is creating awareness for the need for sustainable entrepreneurship. Also, secondly, we also propose developing entrepreneurial skills and three, providing support for entrepreneurs. And by doing so, we said that this can be done through various, for these methods here, such as developing seminars, trainings, providing grants, providing workshops, and also engaging the community at many levels, right? It is not just about talking about it, but it's actually putting it into practice, the concept of humane entrepreneurship. And human security, we believe, ensures people can have access to necessities such as food, shelter, which we saw in the video, healthcare, and education. It also promotes economic development protects human rights, and prevents conflict. Entrepreneurship education through humane entrepreneurship can contribute to human security by creating jobs at all levels, increasing economic growth as well. Moreover, human entrepreneurship is about building businesses that prioritize society first and the environment well-being. It is about creating value for the business owner, the community, and the planet. Entrepreneurship education can also teach individuals how to build socially and environmentally responsible businesses that contribute positively to society. But it is clear also that humane entrepreneurship and in particular entrepreneurship education can also promote gender equality and empower women, Chantaline. Women entrepreneurs face unique challenges, including limited access to finance, networks, and markets. Entrepreneurship education can give women the skills and knowledge to overcome these barriers and start their businesses. So is there a correlation is there a correlation between both? Absolutely, there is. Is there a straight path? Not necessarily, but it takes an ecosystem to bring it together. Thank you, Chantaline. Thank you so much, Ayman, and thank you for sticking to time. Um, I'm not sure now who uh, would be more, so I'm trying to put these logically, and maybe we go to Stuart. Stuart, um, you've been, um, your, your, your team is a sustainable livelihood for human security. I think I'll keep Natalia for last because she's gonna come with a bigger picture. Um, so why don't you come in, uh, Stu? Kia ora. hi everybody. Kia ora, Chantalyn, thank you for inviting me and thank you everybody for having me on the panel. Uh, kia ora koutou. it's an honor to be here. I'm a humanitarian work psychologist, so um, I my discipline, the, the world of work has been radically changed since the pandemic and the, the, the great disruptions, and uh, the world of work has changed and my discipline and profession has had to change with it. 
And I, I think what I'm going to talk about, sustainable livelihoods is an alternative to the job. Um, my discipline put a lot of stock and faith, like the rest of the world, in the job as a means of delivering sustainable livelihoods and thereby all of the SDGs and all of the facets of human UN human security. And I think we, we've had to change our thinking and our way of teaching in our curriculum. Um, just very quickly, what is this, what makes a livelihood sustainable? Um, if we go back to the Brundtland Report, although it's arguably a, a, an ancient concept, it's been around since people have been around. But uh, according to the Brundtland Report, it includes things like maintaining and enhancing human capabilities, so valued functioning. So not only maintaining, but enhancing. And the same for assets, you know, maintaining and en enhancing assets. And those assets can help people, for example, to cope and recover from stress and shocks, and the world has had a, certainly had enough of those lately. Recover from stress and shocks, uh, stress and shocks. Also support other sustainable livelihoods. So it's an inherently social concept, both today and tomorrow, at the global and the local level, in the short and longer term. And we might also add, if we go back to ancient history and farming occupations, the idea of cereal mixing. And, and what I'm saying there, what the definition is saying is that sustainable livelihoods are braided together, one person to the other, one group to the, to the next. But um, they can also be uh, braided in terms of activities that any one individual will perform. And in cereal mixing in ancient times, farmers would plant multiple seeds at the one time, not rely on multi-cropping. So if the drought knocked out one or two, there'd be a third and a fourth one. And in a way, the job, what the amount of faith we placed in the job is a bit like that monocropping. We're not saying throw out the baby with the bathwater. If you've got a good job and it's secure and stable, you're very lucky. Good on you. But most people in the world are in a situation of precariousness. In other words, economic insecurity, which washes into food insecurity, health insecurity, and eventually into environmental security, as Chantelin was saying. Um, if we look at the job very quickly, uh, it's a bit of a broken promise. If we look to the baseline, the last time we had stable statistics, 3.3 uh, billion people in work, 172 million unemployed. That's a scourge, but many more people, <laughs> a scourge on humanity, but many more people in work. But the problem was a lot of it was precarious. So um, we're 3.3 billion, about two thirds of those working in the informal sector, very often in vulnerable work conditions, so inherently insecure, no stable job, in fact, to speak of, irregular pay, unsafe and so on among the remaining third up to up to 60 percent were reporting that they were struggling to make the ends meet economically and financially and socially so that that's a world that's characterized by precariousness and being in vulnerable employment and the world bank no less the world bank group at the end of 2019 was saying we need to protect people not jobs if we go post uh, post pandemic we've got the rise of ai, AI We've got digital platforms multiplying. Uh, we've got a quickening of automation and the platforms, increasing unemployment, decreasing number of work hours available, rising working uh, po po poverty and the cost of living. And we've got the director of the ILO, Guy Ryder, saying we cannot afford to go back to pre-crisis levels. So we've got, an, in, in effect, a, a precarious world of work. Sustainable livelihoods are the opposite of that. And, uh, you know, they, they, they speak to the, you know, the sustainable livelihood is not individual, it's much more social, it's less single, it's more plural, it's not present focused as the job is, it's more future focused, it's less controlling and more emancipating, uh, it's not necessarily formal, it's it's aformal, it's not just organisational, it's interorganisational that speaks to the connections with people, between people, and it's not just material, it speaks to the potential and damage to the environment and the need to protect the environment. And so it's a, it's a radically wider and more diverse and inclusive concept. I think what I'll do now to save time is just go through the sorts of things we've been doing in the curriculum that actually speak to sustainable livelihood and start to replace the job. Um, in all the teaching we put out, the SDGs up front, so decent work number eight, decent work and, and economic not growth, not all, up front, but it's um, it, all the goals are interconnected, of course. Uh, in terms of work security, which the ILO talks about um, in, in its decent work agenda, we, we talk about the equivalent of serial mixing. So how do you braid a livelihood individually from different forms of economic activity? Fair incomes is another pillar of decent work. Uh, we, we use the example there, Project GLOW, Global Living Organizational Wage, which looks at the humanitarian work psychology of living wages across global supply chains. I know UNCTAD has done a huge amount of work in this space 
on the need to focus on equity along global supply chains. That's the social connection, the braided socially part of sustainable livelihoods. Um, AI solutions, we include robotics engineers in our courses. They're working hard on, on, on solutions to environmental protection, protecting people, but they also need social science input. And we know that AI potentially threatens uh, employment. And we need to look at that braided idea through things like basic income, universal basic income or otherwise. So we've got a work, humanitarian work psychology of basic income coming into the discipline, the profession and the classrooms. And it's not just that the, the climate threatens work. As Chantalin was saying, work often threatens the climate and the environment. We've, we've, we've maybe had more success on the first half of the SDGs at the expense of the latter half. And you've got to look at the way that work, a lot of jobs are dirty in themselves, coal mining, driving diesel trucks, whatever, are ways of actually impact on the environment. We've got to look at that. So we've got a project called Project Slate, which is sustainable livelihoods in the environment. And it's a difficult conversation about some of the forms of employment that are actually contributing to climate damage and climate change. Um, and and uh, the last but not least, and I, you know, I think Eamon was talking about this, um, we've got to go to maybe the idea of building one's own sustainable livelihood and in the classroom. And that fits with the entrepreneurship concept, whether it's business entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship. So that's a huge part of the, of the solution as well. But building your own sustainable livelihood is a radical switch in the curriculum, how we teach humanitarian work psychology and indeed education as a whole. Kia Koto, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stu. And, and very interesting. We see a lot of trend now emerging. And there's a question in the chat that I want you to start thinking while Natalia will present. How do we need, how do we define value creation to our student? Are companies creating value, destroying value, or extracting value? Just we teach rationality and Newtonian paradigm, certainty, stability, value, neutrality. We don't teach the meaning of value. Why not? So think about that while Natalia is going to, um, and um, Natalia uh, Aguilar Delgado is assistant professor at the International Business Department at HSC. And uh, she will be talking to you about teaching, human, teaching development, international development and human security. So Natalia, please. Thank you very much, Chantaline, uh, for the invitation to join this panel. And thank you all for the participants for sharing their experiences. So today what I'm going to do is sharing with you a little bit of what we have been trying to do to embed alternative ways of thinking about development in a business school. So it goes a little bit with the question that, that has just been raised in the, in the Q&R. So um, in a way, what, what we have been trying to do with some colleagues is trying to go beyond the mainstream narratives about the role of companies and more precisely of MEs in the global economy. Uh, so presently, I'm teaching and I'm developing two courses on social innovation and development at the bachelor's level and also at the master's level. And they are co-developed co with Professor Maleto Zebon and one course at the doctoral level on global value chains um, So with Professor Ari Banaj. So what I'm trying to do here in my five minutes is to try to illustrate a little bit how we incorporate certain principles within uh, the, these, uh, these courses um, that in, in fact, we, we try to embrace what we call transformative learning uh, by adopting uh, three main interconnected principles. So uh, I'm going to try to give you examples as we go out because we don't have a lot of time. So the first principle that we really try to nurture with students is empathy and social awareness. Okay, so in a business school, you may think that this is something that, you know, uh, it's not... Uh, it's, it's, it has become more and more important as a soft skill, as they call it. But uh, we, we try to push students to be more aware and sensitive. So trying to understand other people's realities. And to be able to do that, we have to put them into action. So to understand and live uh, a concrete example, a concrete uh, situation uh, that most of them haven't had the chance to, to, to live in. So in the bachelor's course, an example that we do is that we always work with a real mandate uh, from a community organization where students, they must co-construct uh, with a partner organization, so a com real community organization with a real need. Uh, in the past, we had students building, for example, social business campuses for organizations such as Litinaha, which is a local um, uh, community organization here that supports people who are socially and economically, and economically vulnerable. 
um, uh, at risk of homelessness. Okay, uh, so in th this, for example, this group they offer many reintegration and training programs, services, and they try to to really support and adapt the realities and the needs of these these people. And students had to really, you know, do do interviews, visits, observe, um, and this was something that they did, and they were able to create. Uh, very interesting recommendations for the organization itself. Um, so this is one example of the first principle. So the second principle that we apply uh, is open-mindedness. So meaning being receptive, receptive to different ideas, alternative ways of doing things. Um, and an example of that is in the master's course of social innovation and development, where students are invited to study alternative ways, alternative perspectives of development. So going beyond the traditional ways of thinking about development, which would include, for example, indigenous visions, southern models, so Ben Vivir and other types, Ubuntu and other types of uh, alternative models. And we invite them to critically analyze traditional interventions for development uh, using these models. And we also partner with uh, international development consultants. And we, we try as well to provide real recommendations that are based in these in this concrete examples, concrete cases for them to be able to think about alternatives, right? So think about different ways in which we could do these things. And the third principle, um, it's critical thinking, right? So all of them are interconnected. So we really encourage students to evaluate critically what are the established models and be aware of the biases and assumptions that we ourselves hold and these models as well, right? So one concrete example of how we do this is um, we apply this at the, GV, the Global Value Chains doctoral course, where we include a more critical perspective on these perverse consequences of GVC practices, right? So we question, for example, the impacts of notions such as economic, social, and environmental upgrading, cascading compliance, which we take for granted as being also, you know, as models of fixing or correcting uh, the, the perverse consequences of GVCs. But we also invite students to unveil the political nature behind the big push you know, for for this uh, for GVCs as a key model for development. Are there other ways of doing things, right? So we push students to do that. So the goal uh, in all these different interventions is really to promote a shift in the mindsets of students, hopefully enab enabling them to integrate in their actions and their choices and their lifestyle, ways to nurture a more inclusive and just world. So um, this is what I had prepared. I believe this is the time I had, but uh, I'm open for more questions. Thank you so much, Natalia. And what's interesting is with Ayman, we've been working on the idea of a, a fourth principle, I would think, which is entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and um, yeah, so we, you know, we've been talking in the question and I'd ask Luciano, who just joined us, Marin Cruz, uh, to be respondent to, to some of the issues. And, and Luciano is um, director of the Social Impact Center and board of the member of the HSA, amongst other things. And Luciano, because I think you may be, you know, in responding to, to what you heard, can you also add, maybe address this idea of the value creation and then everybody else, I bring you back in as well as I would like to hear the experience from the student, because what you, you, you know, I many have done and, and Mariana, I know you do, though you did mention it, but everybody mentioned is that in the student directly and can they learn better in the class or did they learn better if we threw them right into uh, guided, but out there in the real world, because it seems to be, um, this is what we're heading for. So uh, Luciano, <laughs> Please. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so I've been uh, maybe what, what I can do is just to comment a little bit on what I've been hearing, you know, from the different panelists. So the, there is one idea that I think is very interesting here, which is uh, this idea of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial mindset. Right. So this idea that it's uh, entrepreneurship is not the, the end in itself but it's more about the skills that we're gonna uh, try to train students on so that they are able to develop, to entertain that, and they can use that, even if it is not for the, their, uh, uh, the, the entrepreneurial project they have right now, but for something that they want to develop in the future and to be more innovative. So th this is one thing that we try to do a lot in our programs too, and I think it's interesting that it's emerging here. The other thing uh, that, that I found very interesting is the idea of ecosystem. So uh, it was mentioned that we need an ecosystem to support 
um, uh, entrepreneurs uh, to support some of those practices. And, and I'd like to insist a lot on this idea because I really believe that uh, we, we need to work and put universities back uh, to the center of uh, what needs to be done in this world. So we need to call for the responsibility of universities. And I certainly see that those ecosystems, of course, they need to be formed by organizations, by NGOs, but we need universities there. And I think that one of the key components, and maybe here is where I can bring something that we've been doing at HSE Montreal, is how can we reconnect uh, research teaching and transfer or outreach. So how can we see our roles, not just as a teaching university, not just as a research university, but as an university that has a central role in society and that tries to connect the three of them. Very briefly, uh, we have one a major project that we developed with a, a financial cooperative here in Quebec, which is Desjardins. And what we've been doing is that we go to developing countries. We've been going to Sri Lanka, Tunisia, Haiti, Colombia. And usually what happens is that they work with uh, local financial institutions, microfinance institutions that they need to support entrepreneurs that come from a marginal, uh, marginalized condition. So rural entrepreneurs, woman, youth. And what we do with them is that before they do any kind of intervention and training with those entrepreneurs, we go with them, co-construct training opportunities. We test those different forms of training that we can try. We will use randomized trials so we can apply a research perspective on that. And once we find the one that can really better support those local entrepreneurs, so then they take it and they scale it. So then they go and they train thousands of uh, entrepreneurs following that method. So for us, it's a very nice way to connect our students, PhD, master students, to come in and participate in those kinds of projects. It's a nice way for us to develop pedagogical material that we use with entrepreneurs, but we bring back to the university and use in our courses. We have lots of data that we can use for research and for publications. And of course, we have outreach because we have the opportunity as an university to impact thousands of students, uh, sorry, of beneficiaries of entrepreneurs. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and of course, I can elaborate on all those elements if needed. Thank you so much, Luciano. Now I'm gonna circle right back to, and Mariana, I interrupted you, but I want to bring you back in now. Um, and you, you know, you come in on the financial side. So definitely this value creation, I think you can answer that question. And you did answer that question in your book, actually. So maybe you you give us the short version here. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, thank you. I think it's extremely important that, uh, you know, we do what we do to accelerate the implementation of UN SDGs within planetary boundaries. So this is the bigger context that we need to keep in mind. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, that needs to be narrowed down to whatever the entrepreneur does and what, where the money goes so that, you know, it, together we contribute to that. So from a, a due diligence perspective, and that's true for both the entrepreneurs, the team, but also from the investor, because we all belong to the same ecosystem. Um, I've developed a five-step uh, due diligence process. Number one is the business plan and you know the traditional financial view and so on. Number two, but this is in no, no particular order, order. They're all important at the same time. Uh, step number two is uh, how the, the the idea of the enterprise fits within the, the UN SDGs and the global uh, crisis that we are currently having, in, you know, and how does that contribute? And we all know uh, the strategies that are needed in order to implement the UN SDGs uh, within the time that we have uh, left. Um, that, number three, which is what most uh, of my previous speakers have uh, have spoken to, is uh, the, the individual entrepreneur. Number uh, four is the team. How do they fit together you know, to address the, the goal of the enterprise? And then uh, the decision um, you know, to invest or not, or to pursue that. So that's an extremely important thing. And of course, um, all the factors that have been uh, mentioned, open-mindedness and so on, I would like are extremely important um, and, and compassion and so on. I think one thing that is extremely important that I, was part of my presentation is um, the mindset that needs to shift from a reductionistic mindset, mechanistic, 
materialistic mindset to holistic from the linear thinking to exponential thinking because technology develops exponentially and we if we as humans are not able to follow suit we will fall prey to ourselves thank you thank you so much marietta very good point uh May I ask, uh, and we have uh, we have to finish exactly at 50. So may I ask uh, Ayman and Stuart to come in, please. Um, thank you, and thank you, uh, Chantaline. And all the comments made by my colleagues are fantastic here. And I wanna operationalize it by giving an example of what we do at George Washington University. Um, two, uh, two years ago, um, we have something called the new venture competition, which many schools have, which is student-led initiatives or, or, or businesses here. Um, we did a simple exercise for that year. We asked them when they submit their application or their business idea to map it to one of the SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So if it was a, an idea on, on a restaurant or on a, an app for healthcare, and um, initially the idea was kind of kind of have, was very tepid response to it saying, well, you know, how would students know and how would they implement it and how would they figure it out? What we realized is that these students are very innovative, right? And they're both innovative and creative and more in tune with, with, with connecting the SDGs to business propositions. And, and what we were shocked also to see as a side, as a side that we didn't expect is that we got more sponsorship funds from organizations supporting the students because of the SDGs, right? So you can see that there, there's a goal path, there's a path forward in which we can, it's not on to us, but we can give it to the new generation, to the younger entrepreneurs, to give us ideas of, of creative solutions, especially in human security and health security and so forth. So this is an example of something simple as just asking them to map their business propositions to an SDG and then come back and realize after the fact that they pretty much tackled a lot of the 17 SDGs and as, as, a, as an opportunity, as an entrepreneurial opportunity, not just a solution, but something that is triple bottom line. They generate revenue, they help the world, and they also have a, a social impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayman. And I must say that uh, we had a special issue of the journal, International Journal of Journal of International Council of Small Business, where we documented the impact. And Stuart, I will jump again, sorry, but because Natalia and I actually talked about that, maybe Natalia can give us an impact. You mentioned uh, of of students, how it changed their mentality, how it changed their approach, and even their career, uh, the sure. classes that the way you you teaching them as well. Sure, sure. So yeah, so the idea with the transformative learning is in fact this 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 type of we have been and we should be better in documenting documenting that um, because there, we we witness a shift in trajectories, right? So um, I had in the past many students in the finance uh, major uh, that took the course and decided uh, to really shift gears and do other things. So. Just to give you a few examples, right, of how these things come up. So, for example, I had students that they they decided to uh, to create. So, going back to the entrepreneurial type of thing, so they 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 in fact were very you know like financial consultants. They were in the finance world, and then they decided to shift gears and really open their 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 own um, entrepreneurial uh, activity um, and basically using many of the things that we had discussed in class. So the idea of inclusion, right? So shared value. So going back to the, 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 the concept that we have been talking about that was raised by one of the, uh, the, the people that were listening to our panel. Um, so how, how do you create a, uh, an entrepreneurial activity that that really tries to share value, right? That really tries to include people and not leave people behind. So um, they they created this uh, energy bar uh, uh, company that it's a social enterprise that tries to give back to communities in Senegal. They work with women cooperatives, uh, and they also have lots of concern with with uh, the environment as well. So, including biodegradable packaging that has been uh, an award winning uh, actually uh, initiative here in Canada. Um, so, really trying to go beyond this idea of sustainability as compliance, right, or as something that you know we are going to do it. We have to incorporate because it's a regulation, and we have to respond to that. It's a threat. But not really, you know, the sustainability is at the center of the concern. We're trying to build new companies, new ways. And, and I believe, and we have talked about that, Chantaline, that, that this new generation is diff, it's, 
it's wired differently, right? So they have already, you know, a different way of looking at things. It is up to us, you know, to really nurture that and help them to, to go uh, in this direction. Thank you so much, Natalia. And I must say, and I invite everybody else, Natalia has been kind enough to help us, as I mentioned, the new economics for sustainable development, which include, of course, the green economy, but the blue, the purple, the orange, the social solidarity economy. In our class, she's going to invite her student to document business model in support of those new economics. So inviting everyone on this webinar that want to join. But Stuart, please, um, from, from the sustainable livelihood point of view, I, I'm curious to, uh, yeah, to hear you. Yeah, I agree with the panelists, uh, the panelists that um, the students are ready for a big change, right? So they, they, they want to see that the change happen. They're into the SDGs. It resonates with their own experience. Many of them are in precarious work themselves as they're trying to fund their studies and they're looking to the future. One of the big criticisms of disciplines and professions like mine in the past has been that we've been servants of power and in particular, servants of economic power. And that means that we've def defined value in terms of things like efficiency and you know, effic business efficiency, organizational efficiency. And then we've kind of, in, in work psychology, we've kind of tacked on uh, human well-being at the end and said, yeah, of course, it's about human well-being as well. I think that the value creation uh, equation is really shifting and, and we want to, students want a figure ground reversal. So bring if well-being to the front, push it, don't lose efficiency. It's, you know, SDG G8 is um, a decent work and economic development or economic growth, whatever, but push, bring well-being to the, to the foreground. And that's where you'll add the value. And, and we focus a lot on various aspects of well-being from physical to mental to social, environmental, and out to the ecosystem's well-being as well. I've mentioned Project uh, Glow and Project Slate. We've also got another major project called SAFE, which is security assessment for everybody. And this is bringing us back to human security. So looking at the way that uh, interventions, activities, uh, changes, focusing on well-being can actually improve uh, human security, not only economic, but out towards all seven and more, including, for example, global and cyber cyber security. Um, and, and, you know, those we've developed a measure for that, which shows that they are actually interlinked. So well-being would be my answer to that very good question about value creation. Thank you so much, Stuart. It's a perfect fit for uh, the, you know, we, the Secretary General's ask us, UNCTAD, DESA, and, and UNDP to work on Beyond GDP, a measure of progress beyond GDP. We're starting the consultation with the regional groups now. And I think, you know, in addition to new economics and new business model, what we need is is, is a new measure of progress that will incur, minimize the trade-offs and, and maximize the synergies. And I think I, I, everything that we've said so far uh, go in that direction. I would like each one of you, so you all know the World Academy of Art and Science is a partner of the UN on the UN Security for All. And this conference is about, you know, setting the stage and asking the questions, the right question for better uh, teaching economics, um, in this case, for human security. So I'm going to go a quick round. Uh, we have uh, five minutes. So that means one minute each. <laughs> what is it that we need to do uh, in the next step to actually teach economics for human security? So uh, let's see. Natalia, can I start with you? You might up cream. You sorry. didn't give me time. <laughs> okay. Who is but it's ready? okay. Well, it's, it's, it's okay. I can, you know, but I, I think I think we can, you know, like for me, it's it's I always try to think about how can we make things more inclusive, right? And I think that from a perspective, you know, like you know, a woman myself, uh, but also, you know, in terms of other types of uh, EDI concepts that we can think about and and also in terms of uh, north and south, you know, like how can how can we make the world more inclusive? And I think uh, in in teaching, this is also something that it's a reality that it's 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 hard, it's difficult, also to include students uh, with their own, you know, uh, um, vulnerabilities, their own aspects. So I would say, you know, how how to think about inclusion. You know, like sometimes it's it's we talk about it, but we don't actually that into practice as well so um yeah i would say you know more inclusion is it's something that i am myself i'm i'm you know struggling with that uh, and it's i'm striving for that in my courses 
Thank you, Natalia. And indeed, I think you can't have an efficient or, or appropriate policy if the people that the policy is addressing are not at the table defining that policy. And that's the problem we're having with women, refugees, youth, and everybody else for that matter. Um, Ayman. Very difficult question, but a very important question. You know, people don't remember words, to be honest with you. You know, it's, words come and go, but people remember numbers more. So like the 17 SDGs is a guiding way of doing it. So I propose that we, we put together the, the three or the five guiding principles, right? And make sure that it's identifiable and they're very clear at flag posts for everybody. Is it integration? Is it ecosystem? Is it value creation? Whatever it might be, we have to put them as, as numbers and with clear, with clear identifiers and ask the students saying, have you reached those guiding principles? There are three of them or five of them. We need to start putting them together in a way where people remember them more. And, and if you remember them, then you apply them and then you measure them. And if you measure them, you have impact. Brilliant. Mariana. We, um, our very existence and economy, uh, economies around the world are threatened by the climate change. And so, um, that's why moving forward, we need to decarbonize, to create, to come up with the decarbonized economy. And uh, in the transition phase, and this is what I was trying to do with my presentation, uh, the technologies and the convergence of technology is available in order to ensure that we're moving away from uh, more carbon emissions toward negative carbon emissions. And the biggest questions to uh, question to address, which is, uh, you know, I'm asking everybody uh, and all students, every every thinking soul, collective intelligence around the world to think about where, how are we going to close the resource gap? Because uh, moving toward uh, batteries and uh, battery technology and less uh, emission and uh, uh, you know, technology that ensures the uh, food for all the, the planet and so on without raising cows and so on needs resources, metals and minerals. So we need yep. to do a lot of thinking around that. Thank you so much, Marianne. It's actually something I've just had a call with the Secretary General's team two weeks ago, a week ago, because we want to make sure also developing countries are makers and not takers of, of renewable energy. They have the resources. They need to process them, not just export them. Uh, so and I just said a podcast. Uh, I would everybody inv invite everybody to um, join them in my last uh, inv integral investing podcast with, uh, um, with Jared Barron on uh, the metals company. Uh, so it's, it's a big, big, big topic, that, but we need to address those. Excellent. Luciano, you'll be last, but not least. So get ready as we go to Stuart. <laughs> Stuart. Oh, oh, me. OK, yeah. So, yeah, I thank you. I think uh, that what we need to do is redefine our own li livelihoods for our sustainability. Uh, these conversations like this around a table, interdisciplinary, getting towards transdisciplinary, are vital. We're really stuck in our silos. So, we need to do SDG 17, the only process goal in the 17, which is the partnerships one for development for the goals. Uh, we need to have more conversations with each other. Uh, psychology needs to talk more to economics, economics to psychology. We need to have community <laughs> practitioners in there, engineers for robotics and so on. And we need to do that in a way that reflects the goals, reflects the facets of human security. Uh, an example, an exemplar, there's a new book coming out, edited uh, by a team at Massey University, but it's 22 different contributors from around the world on tackling precarious work in the science, uh, PSYOP Routledge series. But it's it's interdisciplinary. It's not just work psychologists. It's economists. It's social yeah. psychologists. It's a whole range, robotics and so on, a whole range of different approaches. We need more projects like that, not only books, but in the classroom as well. Exactly. And now you're all connected on this call. You're all from all different parts of the world. Uh, and so I hope you're going to keep the dialogue. But I, don't, I want to stay in time. Luciano, I promise to give you the last word. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'm taking a very pragmatic approach uh, here at HSA. And one of the things we are doing is that we already have the framework. We have the SDGs, the 17 goals, the 17 major issues. And what we are doing is that it's not enough for us anymore just to have one mandatory course on this topic in every program. What we need to do now is to make sure that we have in every course, in every mandatory course, we have a kind of an integration of those issues and how those different areas, they can address those issues. So this is what we are trying to do right now. 
to really make sure that students, they are not gonna hear something in one class and something completely different in another one. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, Gary Jacobs, the president of the World Academy of Art and Science uh, is with us and I'm sure he's taking uh, vivid notes. Uh, we stay within our time. So I wanna really thank all of you for accepting uh, to join us today to be part of this discussion. And I hope it's just the beginning. We'll, be, we'll keep continuing. So thank you so much and uh, to be continued.